Hey there, guys. Welcome into the show. Welcome into a, another episode of The Collectors. As always, I am your host, Chad Starbuck. Um, you can find me out on Instagram at I Remember When Vintage, and I certainly appreciate you guys following along. And for those of you who have been following along and watching the Collector series, thank you so very much. And if you haven't done so already, just click right down there on that subscribe button. Uh, that way you will be updated when uh, new episodes come out. Now some of you have probably noticed that uh, the set behind me has changed up a little bit since we did our first show. And primarily that's because most of those items behind me are for sale. You can find a lot of those out on my Etsy shop, um, which is also titled I Remember When Vintage. Um, so if you get a chance, go and check out the shop. Why don't we just go ahead and jump into today's episode. My guest today is Derek Rimbelski. Uh, Derek is from uh, Central Michigan. And I think Derek has probably been uh, collecting passionately probably for about the last 10 years. Uh, he's a buyer, he's a seller, and he's a collector. And we're going to get that chance to, uh, to see his collection today. So why don't we go ahead and join into that conversation with Derek Rimbelski. Hey, Derek, welcome into the show. Thanks for being on today. Okay, thank you so much. Super excited to be here. Oh, that's cool. Hey, so we haven't known each other for very long, um, but I have certainly been following along with what you've been doing on Instagram and um, checking out your pictures and, and, and some of the things that you collect. And I've certainly noticed, I mean, you and I have a lot of similarities um, in regards to kind of what we like and such. Um, so you should definitely be pretty proud of, of some of the items that you have. So uh, kudos to you there. Appreciate that. Now, Derek, in, in, in my eyes, you are certainly a, a young collector. So uh, I'm guessing that um, you probably got your start, um, like how long ago? So I started right around 2012, 2013. Um, I opened my Etsy shop in 2013. Um, so yeah, I would say somewhat recent, you know, as far as, uh, as that goes. Um, feels like it's been a lot longer to be honest with you it doesn't feel like it's only been I guess seven eight years now but uh yeah I haven't been doing it that long I'll be I'll be 30 come come March of uh of 2021 <laughs> so crazy to think I'll be there that that quick but uh yeah it's been a great time so far I, I wouldn't trade doing this for anything honestly it's been super enjoyable so uh, based off that how did you get the bug um related to collecting what was kind of your inspiration you know, that's honestly a good question. I get asked that a lot. Um, I don't really have parents or grandparents who are really into antiques or they didn't really have like a really neat family history as far as like a business or something that just lasted in the family. So I never really had like a family connection. Um, but I've always been into just things in general. Growing up, like I loved Legos. I had just shelves and shelves and shelves of these displayed Lego kits. And it was <laughs> quite ridiculous, honestly, the amount that I had and all displayed. And, <laughs> and I've always had this knack for a business and kind of combining a collector, kind of a collector idea, but I never knew what I wanted to do. I knew I liked things and I knew I had a passion for business. And it really wasn't until about 2012, 2013, when you know, American Pickers started getting popular. You kind of right. started seeing things on TV and in media about antiques. And I didn't really know a whole lot about it, but it definitely caught my interest. So I decided, you know, I'm going to go to a local flea market, a local antique show and kind of see what it's all about. Yep. And as soon as I went to the first show, it was like an old engine tractor show, not really an antique show per se. It wasn't real curated. Um, and I was just floored by the things that were available. And the prices seemed so reasonable for, I didn't really know, <laughs> I guess, what was neat or desirable. I just kind of had to trust what I thought was cool. Right. And it seemed to work out. So I bought a few things. I maybe spent maybe a couple hundred bucks that day and I, I got a lot of stuff. And I kind of started putting some pictures online and people seemed to start liking it. And the next thing you know, it just kind of took off. And I thought, wow, like people, you know, people, people can do this. This is something that I can do. You know, it seemed so so unrealistic at the time but a little bit of uh of dabbling and next thing you know here i am yeah that that is pretty cool i i, I bet there's a lot more collectors that got started with legos than we probably think um That's true. and now legos are very collectible themselves. exactly so, kind of yeah. going back to your start do you do you remember like that first thing that you got so the first thing that i got that truly made me want to expand my horizons was was my pure globe and i'm not sure if this is too early for your next question but i'm gonna get into the pure globe that's kind of the first item that really got me kind of inspired i guess yeah. um tell us about it go ahead okay okay so that that pure pure is a gasoline and oil company um they're really dominant in michigan and my dad he did work gas and oil um 
and Pure was one of the oil companies in which they distributed. Yep. And this lens is a beautiful gas globe lens. What a one on the top of a pump. It's now in a nice oak shadow box that my dad had made for me. He had given that to me. Um, and ever since I had that piece and I, I realized, you know, the value, the nature of the piece, how rare it was, how, how older collectors would be so they would, you know, twist an arm to have that piece in their collection. And I was yeah. just driven to this, you know, that early into my collecting. So that kind of really like sparked the sparked my bug and really kind of got me like, wow, you know, this stuff is, the stuff truly is extraordinary. It's so much more than just stuff, you know? No, I bet, I bet that is beautiful. And that's, yeah, a, that's you know, a really cool thing to be starting out with as well. Most as of what I ended up buying in my first few trips, I kind of just sold, you know, little crates, little just knickknacky things I was drawn to, maybe a little coffee tin with some advertising. Very, very simple Simple things as far as what you and I probably wouldn't maybe collect nowadays, just because we consider it more common. You know, we definitely evolve as, as collectors and sellers. Yep. Um, so, yeah, so yeah, that's that's how that goes. So you and I are probably very similar to that. It's like the the things that I was buying and selling back in 2012 and 2013. I would, I, I don't even touch today. Exactly. Uh, exactly. You, you, yep. you or you paid yourself for something you didn't buy. Exactly. You, you were intimidated by the price tag, or you just didn't know, you know, what you do now. So. Yeah, that is certainly true. So you are from, uh, you're from Michigan. Yep. Yep. Central Michigan. And the, uh, the town is? I am in Frost, little tiny township of Frost, just a little tiny area, you know, five, 600 people, nothing really around, but a post office and a few gas stations. So, so that being the case, I mean, if, it, if it's kind of a remote uh, area and such, where do you go out to pick? So being in a remote area, it does make it nice. I mean, I can drive left, right. I can pull out of my driveway and go either side and I can be in old farmlands. You know, it's, okay. it's super easy um, as far as just the garage sales in my area are great. Um, there's 20 different lakes within 20 minute drive of my wow, home. Cool. So there's always garage sales along lakes. There's always estate sales with cool nautical things. Um, and I just travel. I travel. Honestly, I don't normally leave the state. I don't normally go farther than maybe two, three hours in any given direction. Um, the Facebook marketplace has been a huge thing for me lately. If somebody posts something within a reasonable distance and it's a good deal, you know, lots of times people don't just have one antique item. They have lots of things. So you check up a conversation, you make right. a purchase, you know, next thing you know, hey, are you interested in this? And you're, you know, and you're picking. Um, so living where I do, it's, it's definitely helpful. Um, I think if you were in a real, real big city with, with, you know, the way things are with COVID, with shutdowns, um, it would be a little tough, you know, with the state sales and that being closed down, but I pretty much just rely on myself. I'm not afraid to, to door knock, drive back roads and, and just be friendly with people. Honestly, I, I, I try to, within the first 30, 40 seconds, you know, relay what I'm interested in, you know, let them know, Hey, I have, I have cash I'm willing to buy. <laughs> and normally within first, minute of talking to somebody they're pretty receptive whether it's positive or negative with you know what you're interested in so it's it's worked out pretty good for me i must say yeah definitely i mean if you're able to strike up a friendly conversation with somebody that certainly makes it a lot easier yeah, let them know you're like yeah like a lot more mind. receptive yeah, uh, and yeah. potentially will 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 let you see some of the things that they wouldn't have necessarily show right. up to, uh, to yeah, most people. you know just like-minded people into the same thing so i think once you establish that people kind of they tend to open up a bit you know do you do this full time or is this kind of a hobby of yours or? Uh, this is my full time job. I oh, am cool. totally, totally full time um, on Etsy, you know, selling full time. So, yep, this is my 100 percent my day job. Um, I would imagine if this is kind of your full time job, um, when you're when you're planning your picks or you're or you're then setting up the things that you want to sell on Etsy and things like that. What's kind of your day like? Um, you know, I, I try to have a, a general schedule to it. Um, you know, wake up, process any orders that I have that are outstanding, you know, get them packaged, get them together. Yeah, if I can I, ship I, once a day, that's, that's what I try to stick to. So I, I know people in today's day and age, they really were an instant gratification society. We love fast shipping. <laughs> so I try to promise everything that, you know, if I can get it out before 1 PM that day, it's going out. Um, yep. so it's kind of a crazy day as far as getting things listed, trying to get things packaged and shipped. And then if something pops up or as I see for sale, I know I have to act on it. I have to drop everything and just go. So I try to stick to a schedule, but things can just change on a whim. Like I say, if something pops up that I, I, I have to buy and I know you know, there's right. no way I can miss out on this, drop everything, go make that purchase, you know, come back. But for the most part, it's 
it's it's pretty it's it's pretty uh, black and white as far as trying to stay on a schedule with you know balancing everything, packaging, shipping, and listing. But it's fun. It's enjoyable. I don't feel like I don't feel like it burns me out. It's it's fun. I look forward to listing. I look forward to sitting down with my items and cleaning them off and looking them up and getting them listed. It's just it's just super enjoyable. It's definitely a, a dream job. It's it's not work, you know. That's for sure. Packaging might be work, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't change it for the world. I think it's really no, cool that you're able to do it on a full-time basis as well. There's a lot of people that, that can't. And I mean, if you put the effort into it, um, you can make a decent living at it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So when I had opened in 2013, I was working a full, uh, full-time job IT position. Um, so I had quit my day job, I want to say around 2016. Um, so I've been full-time with Etsy going on about four or five years now. So I had a little bit of a safety net, you know, I'd had my shop open, I've had it established, I could see some numbers, you know, and I could kind of figure, okay, if I can dedicate this much more time into Etsy with my pickings, therefore I should be able to see this much in return, you know, based on the time I'm putting in. And it had just gotten to a point where I figured I could just make more money uh, putting more time into this, you know, than I was making there and it's been the case, so... Now, do you do, um, along with your Etsy shops, do you, uh, do you do any local markets and stuff like in the summer times and such? You know, I do not. I only, so my theory is, is I buy local and I sell nationally, internationally. Yep. My local markets, they really aren't much for selling. Um, great place to buy, but yep. when it comes to selling, it's just, there's just not enough eyes, you know. As you're planning out your picks and, and such, do you kind of have a... Um, a plan as far as prepping for that, well, not necessarily for that day, but for that particular item that you're going out for? So I try to make, well, like, like you said with the day, so I try to make like a full day worth it, right? If I have to drive an hour and a half, two hours to go pick up one item, I'll try to look up some antique shops in that area. I'll try yep. to just kind of look at the area in general. What can I expect? Is it, a, you know, the country area? Is there a lot of farms? Is there um, is there a little old downtown? Could I talk to some people? You know, it's amazing just showing up to a little diner, you know, grabbing a cup of coffee and just chatting with some locals, you know, sure. uh, and just kind of getting the getting the scene. So I definitely will try to make a stop or make a trip, a full trip. You know, like I say, whether that's some little local stores, whether that's talking to people, whether that's asking, um, say, if I buy something from just one individual, you know, do you have any friends, family, relatives, neighbors, anybody you know that may have some old things? And generally, if you pursue those enough, there's something that gets unturned. And very rarely have I ever went on a pick one day and said I came home with nothing and I wasted a tank of gas and I've gotten nothing from that day. There's always something that seems to come, for, come to fruition that made the day worth it, you know. Yeah. Or you'll discover a property that maybe nobody's around, um, but it's a potential place to work on in the future. I can't tell you how many times that happens. Almost every time you're, you're picking up, you know, auction winnings or, or something. And if you're a picker, you're never just looking forward when you're driving, you're always rubbernecking. Um, so you're always discovering what seems like new potential places to pick because the stuff is, it's out there. It just, it just needs to be found, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a good plan. I mean, that's certainly a good way to do it as far as being able to to plan out your day and make sure you're getting the most out of that day. As it relates to kind of the things that you collect and that the that you like the most, mm -hmm. um, what kind of stands out for you is like, what is your what is your niche right now? So I have a few different things that I'm really kind of niching with. Um, so early hand painted wood signs right now are one of my favorites. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in that category, yeah. um, but it seems like porcelain signs, you know, uh, painted metal signs, your typical gas and oil signs, transportation signs, they get a lot of the attention, um, but I really, truly love early, early hand-painted wood stuff. I mean, these people were amazing artists, um, but maybe they didn't have the facility to get a mainstream advertising sign, you know, so they made something a little more rustic. And it just has such a folk art and such a great look and feel and it's such a, it just takes you back to that business, you know, and, and I really, really, really love any of those simple wood signs. And, and a lot of them were, were very general, you know, um, rooms or cabins, sure, or, um, something simple like ice or soda, uh, just basic amenities really. Um, but they just, they age so well with the wood and they just, I don't know. There's just such a warm kind of rustic feeling to these signs. They just, you know, they, they, they never were mass produced hardly. They just, they're so special and unique, you know, they're just, they're, they're really something 
something special. Well, you, you, I think you have one right there behind you that, that is, I as, I, as I look at it, it is selling about a dozen different things. <laughs> it is. So there's gas, there's oil, there's eats, um, <laughs> candy, tobacco, you know, you name it. It's on that sign. Um, his name is Lon. It's Lon Willie's, you know, station. Do you um, remember where you picked that up? So I did. Uh, a gentleman had this for sale. Um, I want to say maybe an hour or so away from where I live. Um, he cleaned out, cleans out old buildings and barns. And this was just something he knew to hang on to. Um, and I was fortunate enough to pick it up. And I, I think if you consider what I paid for it and, and just what it is, there's so many, it just checks all the boxes. And if you actually look at the sign, it's held together by like these two tiny little thin strips of wood. Yeah. And it's two separate pieces of wood kind of, you know, taxed together. Um, and it is double sided. The other side does have quite a bit of paint loss, but it's yeah. just such a phenomenal piece of folk art. And then just early advertising. It's just like I say, it just checks all the boxes, you know. Yeah, it certainly does. It certainly does. Uh, that is a really cool sign. I really like that a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, now, another thing that I'm seeing um, is obviously this clock. What's the story behind that? Well, this clock is a great story. This clock also was a piece, along with the Pure Globe, that really kind of really kind of got my gears going as far as picking and collecting. So I bought this clock um, back in, I want to say around 2016, 2015. Okay. I was actually in North Carolina uh, visiting a friend half half picking trip, half kind of pleasure trip. Yep. And I'm in Matthews, North Carolina, which if you're ever in Matthews, there's like four or five lanes of, of highway going both ways. So it's very, very, very busy. But there's also some old, old buildings along the side. So it's a weird mixture of new and old. Yeah. And there was this gas station there. And I was Bob's, Bob's Tire Store. And up under the canopy was this clock. And I spotted it from the highway, you know, not lit up, nothing. I just kind of saw the silhouette of it. So I finally got to stop in there and I talked to the woman and it was the original. It was Bob's wife. Um, okay. Unfortunately, Bob had passed away. This was Bob's business. They had been in business since I want to say 52, 53. And this clock had been there since the since the inception of the business. And I'm sure everybody and their brother had asked about it. And I'm and I'm talking to her and, oh, yeah, you know, everybody asked about the clock. Um, <laughs> I said, well, did anybody ever, ever offer you any money for it? And she said, well, no. I said, well, I'd be I'd be interested in, you know, making you a fair offer for the clock. So I make her an offer for the clock. And without hesitation, she called her crew and had a couple of the guys out <laughs> back with their ladder. They got it down for me. Um, unfortunately it had, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, but there is a little bit of damage in the plastic bezel. Something must've fallen from the building and it took a little bit of a, of damage there. Um, but it did get the neon restored. Everything else was fine. It just needed a transformer. The tube was fine. Um, and I sent her a picture of it all lit up and she was ecstatic to see it, you know, kind of back in its heyday. So this piece for me is just truly special. I will never sell it. It's just something that's, you know, it's, it's super close to my heart and it's one of those pieces that just really got me going when I found it, you know? Yeah. I think we all have items like that, that um, we, we've come across and, you know, we have certainly, we bought mm -hmm. and we probably just will never sell them or, you know, or maybe, you know, maybe 10 years down the road, you're ready to pass it on to right. somebody Maybe else. I'll be that guy that asks, you know, way too much for it because I truly don't want yeah. to sell it. <laughs> exactly. And I'm fine with that. And we talked a little bit about uh, some of the things that you're niched into now with the signs and things like that. But over the years, is there are there different items that you have built up a collection of? A couple different things. Uh, so I did earlier this summer, I did purchase um, about 150 uh, steel rod and reels. Fishing wow. Uh, combinations. Um, so I've amassed quite a bit of a collection of that. I've been going through them, kind of researching all of those. And I have just a huge, huge area. Uh, I, have, I have my, my back shed and my, uh, my backyard is full of antiques and I kind of have all of them hung up and strung and organized in rows. Um, and like I say, I've kind of, I've kind of niched into those a little bit. Um, I mean, I sell maybe two, three rods and reels a week and I sell them as complete units, rod and reels. And right. I kind of pair them up based on era and uh, aesthetics. I kind of match them up. If I got a, a green baked light rod, I'll put a green baked light reel and I have enough combinations now where I can kind of make them aesthetically together and era appropriate. And I've been selling those like hotcakes. Those sell really well. People seem to love them. Um, so those are kind of something I've kind of like niched into a little bit. And um, I also love uh, tip trays, little advertising oh, yeah. in litho uh, tip trays. So I did, 
I set a few out here for my collection that were kind of more of the ones that stood out to me. Um, I'll start with uh, this little universal stoves and ranges tray. Um, they're small, they're easy, they don't take up a lot of room. They, uh, they're just oh, yeah. of art made by different lithograph companies, all, you know, Chicago, New York, beautiful art on them, very nice condition. Yeah. Don't normally buy them if they're rough, if they're clean, I, I, I do. Um, so that's a universal stoves and ranges. This is a Wellsbach uh, lighting services tray, very Victorian. Oh yeah, um, that's cool. This tray was cool. Um, obviously the graphics are very ornate, very extensive, very detailed. But yeah. I love this early lighting. You know, not many people had lighting in the home. Um, yeah, yeah. When this tray was was made, so to kind of see this advertising, just something as basic as lighting, um, I thought that was really, really neat. It has a really neat, uh, you know, gas fixture above the woman reading there, which is really cool. So, how many of these have you come across? So, like I said, I'm I'm kind of picky with what I buy nowadays. If they're really, really clean and they're you know pre 30s, I'll normally pick them up. I may only have. 10 to 15 at any given time because they are kind of pricey yep. um, and they can fluctuate on price a lot based on how many of them are out there. Um, like for example, there's this old Boone whiskey tip tray. It's probably one of the hardest ones to find. Oh, that is cool. Um, really, really neat subject matter with the cabin. And it's actually stamped on the back by the company that makes it, which is cool. And this was actually something that I found. It was actually on the Facebook marketplace. I was buying a machinist tool chest. Yep. This little uh, tip tray happened to be in the chest and I happened to catch it out of the corner of my eye and I asked for specific pictures of that tip tray. Yep. Well, when I saw the, the maker's mark on the back, I knew it was, you know, I knew it was real. Yep. And for what I paid for the chest and what this tray is worth, um, it's really quite astonishing. There's, there hasn't been any recent sell, uh, sale history on the old Boone tray, but the few that have sold have all sold for over 500. Oh my and, goodness! Wow. And it's just a tip tray, you know, it's not a full size tray. Very, very, very small tip tray. Um, so it's definitely kind of like a undiscovered little market. Those that collect them, they know about them, um, but they're generally you can pick them up, you know, here and there, antique stores or shows. Generally cheap, um, and and if they have really, really good art and they're really clean, they can bring a really good amount of money. Well, I think I think those are really cool. And to be honest with you, I have not seen. I, I can't really think of one that I have seen um, out here in the West where I am. I don't know if it's necessarily, it's kind of where you are. Interesting. You've been able to find them. To hear. Yeah, you wonder. And, and like I say, they're very small. They were probably were easily discarded. Um, and yeah. it is pretty rare to find them very clean and, and, not, uh, and not beat up in war. So, yeah, that's interesting that you don't find as many out there. Maybe it's a regional thing. Hard to say. What do you think is uh, an item that probably has the, uh, the highest value that, that you've come across? So that would have to be probably without a doubt, mobile gargoyle oil cabinet. Uh, it's an island cabinet. Uh, would have sat, you know, between pumps, would have held uh, okay. oil cans, bottles, you know, glass, metal. Um, and it has really, really cool porcelain signs on the outside. It's just, it just commands your attention when you see it. It's large. It's, you know, bigger than a pump. It's wider than a gas pump. Um, it's got two porcelain signs on the outside. It would have originally had three, so it is missing one porcelain sign. Yep. Uh, but it does have an original painted metal, um, basically like a decimal chart would be for machinists, but it's for gas and oil. So this shows yep. all the different types of cars. Um, and the latest year, I believe, is 28 or 29. So the cabinet's very early and shows you all the different grades of mobile oil to use for the different uh, packards and all the different types of vehicles. And it's really cool to see that chart on the inside. And believe it or not, I bought this cabinet, uh, the little town I grew up in, and it was just sitting in this man's front yard, uh, weeds growing around it, and it had been there for years. And what's funny is I actually remember passing that growing up, but not knowing what it was and becoming an adult and knowing what that was. <laughs> and I was able to purchase that cabinet for $300. Okay. Um, cabinet and everything. Well, if you know gas and oil, you can't even buy one of the signs for that much. Right. Uh, you get the whole cabinet, the signs, everything. It's my prized possession. It's I've got it protected out in my back, and it just <laughs> now holds various uh, yard tools and little gardening uh, knickknacks. So it's like it's my prize. It's my prized piece. That's for sure. It's it's beautiful. So that's another piece that's going to stay with you, I guess. It will. Yes. Yep. Yep. That in my clock. <laughs> that in your clock. Well, very cool. 
Now, tell me a little bit, um, another item that I'm seeing right there is this um, City of... City of Marinette. Okay. So that was in Wisconsin. So I purchased this, so it's a life, it is a life preserver ring, City of Marinette. I purchased this from a nautical collector. He was a professor at a college uh, in Central Michigan for about 30 years, and he always had a passion for nautical antiques. Um, and I had been buying from him for years. Really great guy, top-notch stuff. And this life preserver ring, when he bought it, the story was it had washed up on shore in Lake Michigan. So the city okay. of Marinette is a port city in Wisconsin. Okay. Um, and this washed up on shore in Lake Michigan. If you look at the records um, from the city of Marinette, it was a Sooner ship um, and it left port in like 1899 and it sank. Oh. So it only has records of the ship sinking. Um, I can't find any photos of the Sooner. I only have a story. So it's a really unique item. And if you really, really look at the textures and the way the paint is and the way the city of Marinette is applied. Right. Is it 1890s? I don't know. It, it To me, it appears like it, it fits the bill. I reached out to the Maritime Museum of Wisconsin. They can't verify whether it is or it isn't. But it's just a great piece. Um, I mean, I find I found life preserver rings that are much newer, um, but I've yeah. never found anything. I mean, if you wait, if you look at the font and just the details and the patina and the crackling of the paint, and and it's actually four different sections that are sewn to make one life preserver, so it's not all one piece. Um, and it's just it's just so unique and cool. And I can't verify the story. So I just, <laughs> I don't know. And it, it just has to stay where it is until I can put the pieces of the puzzle together, you know? Yeah. Well, that, that is a cool story. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll believe the story. I'll, I'll go. <laughs> on. Yeah. We won't question it. Yeah. We won't question it. Are there well, any other items that um, are, uh, are part of your collecting right now? Um, you know, I've always, I've always loved anything advertising. Um, whether it be gas and oil, tobacco, general store, anything with beautiful advertising right now is kind of kind of up my alley. Yeah, um, and I really, really do love uh, again with the what the fishing pole purchases this year. I've kind of really gotten into the older uh, hunting, fishing kind of rustic things. My father is building a cabin up on one of the biggest rivers in my state right now. So kind of like being exposed to the cabin up north and just old snowshoes and like the stuff up there has really kind of opened my eyes into old creels and old yeah. hand trout nets, you know, the oh, fishing I'm, I'm like, right there with you. Stuff. Yeah. It's got such a great aesthetic and I grew up in a log cabin. So I, I guess that's why I'm more drawn to the rustic kind of look. And I feel like antiques and the rustic lodge type stuff, they just kind of go hand in hand together. They just, you never have to force a look. Everything just looks so natural together. You know, I, I love that. Yeah. I, I'm definitely the same way. It's like if, whenever I come across a creel, Whenever I come across a, a, a wooden fishing net, yeah, um, I will pick those up right yeah. away. An old an Absolutely. old tackle box that might yep. have old lures yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. um, nice graphic on the tackle box or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah most, it doesn't take most... much to get me excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. Hey, before uh, before we go today, um, again, we talked about. I think primarily people can find you on Instagram. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, we know how people can find you. Yeah, so uh, Instagram or Etsy, you can find me, uh, Rombelski's Vintage on Instagram or Etsy. Um, that's my main two social media outlets. Um, but yeah, if you reach me on any of those two platforms, you'll be sure to reach me. I upload uh, daily on my Etsy shop, so I always have fresh finds on there. I don't post everything to my Instagram, it's on my store. But uh, yeah, I would love to, to reach out and talk to you guys and meet new people. So it's great to, to chat with you and uh, talk with more people. Well, let's, let's make sure we um, let people know. How do we spell your last name? Okay, so it's W-Y-R-E-M-B-E-L-S-K-I. And the W-Y is silent. So it's okay. just Rembelski. <laughs> well, very cool. Very cool. I'm sure a lot of people are curious when they see that. <laughs> exactly. It, 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 it took me a while to figure it out. But, right. <laughs> uh, but that is really cool. Hey, Derek, you have, uh, like I said, you've got a great eye. Um, you've got a really nice collection. Um, again, like I said, you should be very proud with what you're doing. And the fact, like I said, the fact that you're able to do this full time, I think is just fantastic. Um, being able to do something that you really enjoy and that you're passionate about and you can make it your business um, is just something to be very proud of. 
Well, hey, I really appreciate that, Chad. That means a lot coming from you. I, you have a great eye as well, and I respect everything you do. So that, that truly means a lot. I appreciate that. Well, Derek, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you, Chad. Great All right, take care. You. Keep thank collecting, you. man. Thanks, you too. Well, there you have it, guys. We have wrapped up another episode of The Collectors. I want to thank our guest today, Derek Rimbelski. Now, the fact that Derek has been able to take something that he is so very passionate about and been able to turn that into a business, I think is something that he certainly should be commended for. You just don't see that very often, especially in somebody that is relatively young for a collector. And I also want to be sure and thank you guys. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked today's episode, be sure and uh, hit that like button. Please share it out with your friends. And if you haven't done so already, uh, please go ahead and subscribe to the series. And then join us next time on The Collectors as we get to travel the country and meet another unique collector and collection. So take care and keep collecting.